using machine learning techniques to help try to moderate the data to help filter the types of comments that they're posting. In fact, the Washington Post, uh, the story is uh, more than two years old now. Uh, the Washington Post uh, uh, story began uh, back in 2017 uh, for this hack. As of 2019, the Washington Post was getting about 2 million comments every month. Uh, of, of which about 70,000 received some form of attention from moderators. Now, uh, mod, mod bot, as they call it, uh, can save hours and hours of manual attention, sifting through comments. Um, but what's interesting to me is in making its determination of whether or not a comment should stay on the site or be filtered out, one of the signals that the AI picks up on is the use of abusive language. <laughs> and oh, interestingly enough, the system was explicitly designed so that uh, abusive language, the abusive language bar will be higher when the comment is about a public figure in comparison to those if the comment is not about a public figure. And this comes from a recognition that criticism of public figures should be allowed in this kind of forum, uh, you know, where we're trying to foster the kind of deliberative discussion about uh, policy making. And so by building their own machine able to tune the value system of the machine learning to be more in line with the journalistic view of the type of conversation that can be supported on the site. Okay, so I'm gonna transition over now to talking about a few examples from uh, another domain uh, that I cover in the book, automated text production. Um, and uh, some, some of you might be familiar with some of these examples. Uh, this is an example of, a, of an automatically generated story um, published by the Associated Press. Uh, every every uh, fiscal quarter, so every three months, they're producing more than about 4,000 of these stories. Uh, and they're earnings reports. So um, I think every company down to a certain sort of uh, size uh, um, has one of these automatically generated reports. Uh, and it just takes in structured data from the earnings report, um, and it uh, generates this uh, using a template. Um, another example of a technology, the Washington Post used a uh, similar form of technology, template-driven technology, uh, in the 2016 uh, election coverage that they published. Um, to give you an example, uh, in 2012, the Washington Post covered 15% of the congressional races in the U.S. In 2016, using automation, they covered 100% uh, of the uh, uh, congressional races. So that included all of the politicians running in the House of Representatives, the Senate, uh, and the, and the uh, gubernatorial campaigns. So far greater cover, breadth of coverage that they were able to provide here. Another example closer uh, here to uh, Scandinavia, uh, Klokspark is a Swedish site uh, that uses automated content production um, together with about 14 sports reporters, last time I checked. Um, that produces uh, content that spans all of the sort of levels of soccer um, in Sweden. So uh, the automated component takes structured data for about each game, uh, puts it into a, a template format, and produces very short, sort of hundreds word long summaries of each game. Really not too fancy. Um, but this automation creates a foundational breadth for the site, right? So it's, it covers everything. And so anyone looking for quick facts about even the neighborhood game will be able to find the story there. Um, but really the automation is serving a dual purpose for this site. Um, so sure it writes the straight, short, factual story, but it also then alerts any of these 14 professional sports reporters and says, hey, this is a particularly interesting local match over here. Why don't you try and get an interview with someone like that? Uh, and then they will go out and get additional quotes, additional information, they'll do additional reporting, and then they can write up, uh, they can either enhance the, um, the original story or they can write up a whole separate story that's that interesting. Um, so another way to look at it is the automation does the sort of routine part of the uh, sports reporting and the reporters get to do some of the more focus on some of the more interesting stories. This example is a, a, a story uh, produced by um, an effort in the UK called Radar. Uh, which stands for Reporters and Data and Robots. Um, and this is a, born out of collaboration between the UK Press Association and a startup called Urb Media. 
And using a team of five data reporters and a couple of editors, it produces an average of about 8,000 local stories per month across the UK. Uh, the stories are run by various local media outlets that subscribe to a wire service that the um, company provides, uh, and this is one of the stories that uh, I'm gonna talk about wire service. So to produce these localized stories, the way it works is that um, Radar takes free, you know, openly available data from the government, um, data that's tabulated by geographic area, uh, and then each reporter, so again, they have five data journalists, each reporter will develop about two stories per week based on the data sets that they find. Uh, and they'll develop those as a data-driven template, um, which would include fragments of text, um, logical sort of if-then-else rules uh, for how to the, translate that data into location-specific facts, uh, and this kind of thing. Um, so the data journalists kind of uh, figure out the various angles and the storylines, what's interesting about this data set, and then uh, they add, they do some reporting, they add background, they add uh, perhaps national context to the story, and then the local bits are adapted and written by the automated uh, aspects. Uh, sort of think of uh, automation as a production assistant uh, in this case. Um, Radar actually uses this tool called ARIA Studio, it kind of gives you a hint at what hybridization looks like in this particular uh, domain of practice. Um, in reality, it's it's kind of just like the next generation of word processor. Um, you know, it lets the author write fragments of text. It lets the author um, uh, integrate uh, data and some logic into uh, into the template or alternatives into the template. Uh, there are some uh, uh, functional aspects. It can help you deal with linguistic declensions and things like that. Uh, so it is um, offloading some of the effort of dealing with stuff uh, on these systems. Um, but, but again, the, the hybridization idea here is that uh, you have the people kind of doing the hard work, figuring out what's interesting about this data, uh, figuring out how to structure this into a story. Those are the things that AI struggles a little bit more with. And then it's having the, the AI, or the automation in this case, um, do some of the simpler, more routine, uh, more rule-bound type of things. So stepping back, stepping back a bit to look at this theme of uh, hybridization, um, you know, it's, I think it's a, an interesting example to, that sort of demonstrates how um, automation is used in concert with human effort. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, in, the, in the domain of journalism, what I found is that AI technologies tend to create new forms of, of work. So things like having to update or tweak or edit uh, or validate, maintain, oversee these, uh, these templates are all new kinds of tasks. Certainly, uh, skills and tasks and jobs will, will evolve uh, to meet these needs, right? Uh, you know, we'll need people who, who know how to write in a particular way to think about what are all the different local stories that could come out from this one uh, national data set? But we'll also need people who understand the technology enough to know how to maintain it and how to supervise uh, these systems. When errors crop up, you know, we need to go back and, and uh, think through uh, how those errors came up and so on and, and fix them. Um, I'm gonna sort of power through here because I know we're running out of time. Um, I want to talk a little bit more forward-looking where I sort of see the uh, future of algorithmic policing and heading. heading. So uh, some of you may be familiar with um, uh, Google Home or Google Duplex. I'll just play a, a brief a snippet of this. Um, this is a technology they launched um, last year now that uh, really allows for very natural interactive uh, dialogue. In fact, uh, you know, when asked uh, um, people oftentimes can't tell that it's a robot speaking. So I'll just play you a snippet of, of what this sounds like. This is uh, an example of Google Duplex calling to make a restaurant reservation, I believe. Yeah, may I help you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve so this is Wednesday the 7th. For Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, Thanksgiving dinner. Okay, this is Google Duplex. Um, what would you like to reserve for Thanksgiving dinner? Four people. Four people when? Um, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, actually, we need to probably after like uh, five people. For people, for people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? <laughs> for next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. We we can talk for people, okay? 
Oh, I gotcha. Thanks. So you have a feel for, for how messy these types of conversations are in reality, and the ability of the AI to deal with that messiness, and also have what sounds like a very natural interaction with someone. So the question is, you know, as these technologies continue to advance, and they will continue to get better and better, what does that mean for, for news production, for journalism? And I wrote this piece for the Columbia Journalism Review um, uh, last year, kind of thinking out, sketching out, what does the future look like uh, for journalism when you have an AI interviewer that could go out and ask people questions on the phone? Uh, how would that enable new types of data collection for journalism? Would that unlock new forms of automated news production? So this is what I mean by sort of news media kind of um, keeping an eye out for which way the technology is heading and thinking proactively about how these new technologies might be integrated into our production chain. Um, I can just imagine a future where, um, where Google uh, finally decides, um, uh, actually, we don't want to have to link to, uh, to local news content. We're just going to generate local news automatically uh, using technology to interview people from communities and bringing that together with a few editors to shape it. So I think uh, news media needs to think more competitively about this stuff. And I think they could be doing more to keep tabs on um, interesting technological communities where, where these um, innovations are, are being published um, in um, uh, knowledge discovery and data mining, machine learning, HCI types of communities. Um, the next idea I wanted to touch on was this idea of how do we design hybridization? So, you know, if we're really kind of um, taking this idea of human-centered AI, we want to design these workflows to bring people and, and AI together uh, in ways that are both effective uh, and efficient, uh, but also are considerate of the ergonomics, the human situation here, right? So uh, do we want journalists to uh, simply be reacting to an assignment from an algorithmic editor, much like an Uber driver needs to react to an algorithm telling that person where to go, where to drive their car to pick up their next, um, their next ride? Um, or can we think more deliberately about how to ensure uh, autonomy and agency and, and sort of the ergonomics of the labor as humans have to interface uh, on a daily basis with these AI systems. Um, I think we also need to think about sort of how to transfer domain knowledge here uh, from journalism into technology. So you can imagine um, uh, you know, having journalists experimenting in newsrooms, so maybe there are some journalists who know how to program and are really good with data. Um, and can be embedded uh, in, in, in newsrooms. Um, you can imagine embedding um, technologists in newsrooms to sort of be surrounded uh, in domain knowledge to understand what are the existing workflows and how does the new technology or how could the new technology fit into those workflows. Um, and then we can also imagine taking journalists, uh, people with, with domain knowledge of news production, and putting them into computing hubs. So where they are uh, in turn surrounded by people with um, uh, more kind of um, advanced technological training. I think there are different models here for um, ensuring that there's a good cross flow of, of domain knowledge between uh, journalists and computationalists. I certainly think, you know, speaking at a university, we should be thinking about developing a human resource. You know, how do we train journalists so that they can work more effectively uh, with these types of hybrid systems? Uh, I think, you know, we can, we can talk about things like computational thinking. Uh, so uh, training people to be able to formulate problems uh, so that um, solutions can be uh, programmatically realized or, um, uh, or data thinking, uh, sort of more data journalism thinking, knowing how uh, the sort of limitations of data, how to critique it, how to sample it, how to validate it, uh, these types of things. Um, and I think for a certain uh, set of computational journalists, some amount of advanced methods training would be valuable as well. So things like um, you know, inference in causality, coping with uncertainty, uh, is, is really a big one. If you think about using a machine learning model <coughs> to identify documents to investigate, as the um, Atlanta Journal-Constitution um, uh, story uh, did, every model has uncertainty with it, right? So how would the journalist think about including that uncertainty in their pursuit of a particular story or their lack of pursuit of that story? Uh, 
how did that factor in? And then the, the final sort of point I want to make here um, relates to the various emerging beats um, that uh, are coming out about as a result of advancements in algorithms and AI. So this idea of algorithmic accountability, algorithms being used uh, in decision-making processes throughout governments and, and, and private sectors and so on, and really um, thinking of journalists as um, uh, being able to scrutinize that technology, being able to critique that technology uh, in meaningful ways. Um, bots and automated media dissemination, certainly this was a, a big topic in the US in the 2016 elections. Uh, you know, how are bots pushing media in different directions online? What are they making trend? Uh, you know, what, what angle or perspective are they pushing? Uh, how is information being manipulated via the algorithm? And I think that's a really interesting beat that more journalists should think about. You know, which way, oh, you can almost think of it like a, like a, like a weather reporter. Which way is the, are the bots uh, winds blowing today? Are they in this direction or that direction? <coughs> Having that overview to help the public understand, well, this hashtag is trending because it's being pushed by uh, you know, um, the Chinese bot army uh, and they want you to think this particular thing about the, the, um, uh, the uh, what's going on in Hong Kong. Lastly, this idea of synthesized media, uh, forensics. So um, some of you may have heard of deep fakes, this idea of uh, a, a, a face swap video where someone is made to look as if they said or did something that they didn't actually say or do. This is enabled by new forms of AI Deep, uh, deep learning types of techniques. Um, and uh, we're seeing more and more of this kind of stuff circulate online. Uh, and there's, I think, a lot of concern uh, with how this could um, enable uh, propaganda or misinformation. And so I think journalists need to be prepared for that. They need to be thinking about how do we develop the processes for verifying this type of uh, material or debunking this type of material? How do we ensure that what we do publish, we know is authentic. So finally, to summarize, I just want to reiterate a couple of my, my main points for today. So I think the, you know, the presence of human value, the news values in algorithmic media is certainly um, important. Um, there's going to be increasing, I think, hybridization of these work processes. Um, and you know, as I showed you, I think you know, it's leading to uh, new beats that are emerging, uh, new ways of thinking about designing news teams, ways of educating journalists. Uh, but I want to remind people that I think it does really all come back to the people in this equation, right? Um, what animates algorithms and AI are the people who design and develop and operate and manage these systems. Um, and so I think the future of, of algorithmic media really must be human-centered. Um, but I'm confident that uh, some of the people in this room are, are helping to invent that future, uh, and I would welcome your questions. Thank you.